Chapter One of The Mysterious Stranger. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Mysterious Stranger and Other Stories by Mark Twain. Chapter One. It was in 1590, winter. Austria was far away from the world, and asleep. It was still the Middle Ages in Austria, and promised to remain so forever. Some even set it away back centuries upon centuries, and said that by the mental and spiritual clock it was still the age of belief in Austria. But they meant it as a compliment, not a slur, and it was so taken, and we were all proud of it. I remember it well, although I was only a boy, and I remember, too, the pleasure it gave me. Yes, Austria was far from the world, and asleep, and our village was in the middle of that sleep, being in the middle of Austria. It drowsed in peace, in the deep privacy of a hilly and woodsy solitude, where news from the world hardly ever came to disturb its dreams, and was infinitely content. At its front flowed the tranquil river, its surface painted with cloud forms and the reflections of drifting arcs and stone boats. Behind it rose the woody steeps to the base of the lofty precipice. From the top of the precipice frowned a vast castle, its long stretch of towers and bastions mailed in vines. Beyond the river, a league to the left, was a tumbled expanse of forest-clothed hills, cloven by winding gorges where the sun never penetrated, and to the right a precipice overlooked the river, and between it and the hills just spoken of lay a far-reaching plain dotted with little homesteads nested among orchards and shade-trees. The whole region for leagues around was the hereditary property of a prince whose servants kept the castle always in perfect condition for occupancy, but neither he nor his family came there oftener than once in five years. When they came, it was as if the lord of the world had arrived, and had brought all the glories of its kingdoms along, and when they went, they left a calm behind, which was like the deep sleep which follows an orgy. Esseldorf was a paradise for us boys. We were not overmuch pestered with schooling. Mainly, we were trained to be good Christians, to revere the Virgin, the Church, and the saints above everything. Beyond these matters we were not required to know much, and, in fact, not allowed to. Knowledge was not good for the common people, and could make them discontented with the lot which God had appointed for them, and God would not endure discontentment with his plans. We had two priests. One of them, Father Adolf, was a very zealous and strenuous priest, much considered there may have been better priests in some ways than father adolf but there was never one in our commune who was held in more solemn and awful respect this was because he had absolutely no fear of the devil he was the only christian i have ever known of whom that could be truly said People stood in deep dread of him on that account, for they thought that there must be something supernatural about him, else he could not be so bold and so confident. All men speak in bitter disapproval of the devil, but they do it reverently, not flippantly. But Father Adolf's way was very different. He called him by every name he could lay his tongue to, and it made everyone shudder that heard him and often he would even speak of him scornfully and scoffingly. Then the people crossed themselves and went quickly out of his presence, fearing that something fearful might happen. Father Adolf had actually met Satan face to face more than once, and defied him. This was known to be so. Father Adolf said it himself. He never made any secret of it, but spoke it right out and that he was speaking true there was proof in at least one instance, for on that occasion he quarreled with the enemy, and intrepidly threw his bottle at him, and there upon the wall of his study was the ruddy splotch where it struck and broke. 
but it was Father Peter, the other priest, that we all loved best and were sorriest for. Some people charged him with talking around in conversation that God was all goodness and would find a way to save all his poor human children. It was a horrible thing to say, but there was never any absolute proof that Father Peter had said it, and it was out of character for him to say it, too, for he was always good and gentle and truthful. He wasn't charged with saying it in the pulpit, where all the congregation could hear and testify, but only outside, in talk, and it is easy for enemies to manufacture that. Father Peter had an enemy, and a very powerful one, the astrologer who lived in a tumbled old tower up the valley, and put in his nights studying the stars. Every one knew he could foretell wars and famines, though that was not so hard, for there was always a war, and generally a famine somewhere. But he could also read any man's life through the stars in a big book he had, and find lost property, and every one in the village except Father Peter stood in awe of him. Even Father Adolf, who had defied the devil, had a wholesome respect for the astrologer when he came through our village, wearing his tall pointed hat and his long flowing robe with stars on it, carrying his big book, and a staff which was known to have magic power. The bishop himself sometimes listened to the astrologer, it was said, for, besides studying the stars and prophesying, the astrologer made a great show of piety, which would impress the bishop, of course. But Father Peter took no stock in the astrologer. He denounced him openly as a charlatan, a fraud, with no valuable knowledge of any kind, or powers beyond those of an ordinary and rather inferior human being, which naturally made the astrologer hate Father Peter and wish to ruin him. It was the astrologer, as we all believed, who originated the story about Father Peter's shocking remark, and carried it to the bishop. It was said that Father Peter had made the remark to his niece, Margaret, though Margaret denied it and implored the bishop to believe her and spare her old uncle from poverty and disgrace. But the bishop wouldn't listen. He suspended Father Peter indefinitely though he wouldn't go so far as to excommunicate him on the evidence of only one witness. And now Father Peter had been out a couple of years, and our other priest, Father Adolf, had his flock. Those had been hard years for the old priest and Margaret. They had been favorites, but, of course, that changed when they came under the shadow of the bishop's frown. Many of their friends fell away entirely, and the rest became cool and distant. Margaret was a lovely girl of eighteen when the trouble came, and she had the best head in the village and the most in it. She taught the harp, and earned all her clothes and pocket money by her own industry. But her scholars fell off one by one now. She was forgotten when there were dances and parties among the youth of the village. The young fellows stopped coming to the house, all except Wilhelm Meidling, and he could have been spared. She and her uncle were sad and forlorn in their neglect and disgrace, and the sunshine was gone out of their lives. Matters went worse and worse all through the two years. Clothes were wearing out, bread was harder and harder to get, and now, at last, the very end was come. Solomon Isaacs had lent all the money he was willing to put on the house, and gave notice that to-morrow he would foreclose. End chapter 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. The Mysterious Stranger, Chapter 1, read for you by Ted Lorm in Fort Mill, South Carolina, during March 2008.